Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overhaul series in Kerbal Space Program 1.1.3. In this episode we're mainly going to be focusing on Mars missions and that's because the Mars transfer window is coming up in 229 days and I want to send a bunch of stuff to Mars on that transfer window. But I wanted to broach the subject of this particular space plane first. There was one good suggestion from the YouTube comments and that was that it was just not providing enough air to the jet engines. Now this says need area 0.402 and I had set the intake to 0.4 a little bit over 0.4 actually I think it was 0.409 but just in case I've upscaled it to 0.5 and I'm hoping and we'll just see we'll keep an eye on whether it's providing enough air uh, such that the thrust from the two engines are equal, right? If there's not enough air, one engine might be providing more thrust than the other, even though really on this layout it, it should be like, you know, they shouldn't be sharing air, but that's not how Kerbal works as we know. Um, so yeah, then that may, means that these tanks are a little bit bigger too, so they've been resized. We'll see how it all works. Let's just try and build another one of these and who knows, maybe it'll fly straight, maybe it won't. That's an experiment, but now let's turn to Mission Control to pick up some contracts for Mars. Okay, well we've got some stuff available here. We've got science data from the surface of Mars. I'll pick that up. We have... Um, there, a low resolution scan of Mars. So that's our altimetry scan in three years. So we'll definitely put um, something to do that on our probes. Also, there are the Deimos missions. This one, transmit or recover scientific data from the surface of Deimos and from space around Deimos. Um, what I want to do is turn to our Deimos probe and see if we can manage that without sending a new mission. So let's just pop on over there and see if it's all right and ready to do some more transmitting of data and maybe it could even get back into orbit around Deimos that doesn't take much after all and yeah well this space technically only requires a little bit of a hop so uh, this we can do anyway duration 15 years I'll just pick that up it's not like these these don't involve enough of an advance to fund an actual new mission so that's why I'm just looking to do a little hop to satisfy them. Okay, here is our Deimos probe, and it looks like it has 433 meters per second left. It's sort of sliding here, but we're not too bothered about that. All right, um, we don't have a connection right now, though, but it still has electric charge, so eventually we'll have connection. All right, let's, uh, let's take that contract then. Okay, I'm now armed with a contract, and we are time warping until we get a connection. I'm sure I've already done all the things. Also, we might be accidentally sliding to a new biome. Who knows? Actually, let's see. Megjeb knows. Surface info. Oh, that should have biome in it. Hold on. Well, I don't know if they'll accept that for the contract. Yes, they will. Mm, we can recycle that one. Oh, here we go. Geiger counter. We uh, that, that was real science. Recycle this. Here, we will legitimately transmit this Geiger counter science. And I think we got a gravity scan science too. Okay. Yep, we definitely got some science, so the contract was fulfilled for reals. Now we need to do it in space around Deimos. So let's go up. Mm -hmm. Let's get a decent apoapsis. Time to apoapsis 53 minutes. That should be long enough. We need at least 20 minutes, remember. Then we'll probably end up landing over some other biome, maybe. I don't know how much of this is Deimos' highlands. 
Okay, oh, there's new signs. So, yeah, uh, magnetometer scan while in space near Deimos we hadn't actually done before. Nor any of the others, so that's really good. I guess we were high over Deimos before. All of them are new. So, good good times. We could probably unlock some new science, thanks to the science that we're getting. Uh, some new, whatchamacallit, research. Thanks to the science we're getting here. There's a lot of stuff. Um, no, cancel. Uh, magnetometer scan is old. Radio plasma wave scan, we can transmit. Micro meteorite detector, transmit. Gravity scan, also above the highlands. Atmospheric pressure. Temperature scan is surface biome dependent. And so is telemetry analysis. So lots of stuff are actually surface biome dependent. So now the question is, can we get over a different biome? Okay, well, we're trying to get over this spot here. And just visually, it would seem like this is not a highland. Right? But... So far, we're still in space just over Deimos' highlands, so I'm not sure. Maybe right at the center, it's not going to be quite so high, hopefully. Well, our contracts are filled. I just wanted some more science, but I guess it's time to just uh, set this little probe down and turn to bigger and better things. Well, not better necessarily. This is this was pretty good. But certainly bigger. Uh oh. Uh okay, we've got a lot of horizontal motion here. There we go. Alright. Deimos' Highlands again. Okay, back to space center. Yeah, I'll consider it landed. 0.1 meters per second. That little excursion took us more than 100 meters per second, but we fulfilled the contracts. Alright, so we'll go from small to large. This is the bopper on the newly designed Nico 2010-6. The bopper is a simple little science probe. It is just that part right on top there. It is carrying a surface ablation laser light imager, a goo container, and the usual small instruments, you know, the, um, no, not that one, the thermometer, barometer, Geiger-Muller tube, and micrometeorite detector, along with some solar panels, but probably not enough to keep it fully charged unless it's in time warp. So it's just going to land with that, and it's got a one kilonewton thruster at the bottom, plus supplementary RCS attitude jets all over the place, including places that might be blocked by solar panels. Um, I really should move those. Uh, yeah, I put those RCS ports before I put the solar panels. Maybe I should only put two solar panels. Eh, they could still help. Anyway, it's got uh, two little uh, Commutron 32s. And 32s because they have one kilo, uh, kilometer of range, not one kilometer, I think a thousand kilometers. Anyway, they have range even when retracted, so that's important. And down here we have the orbiter portion, of course, and it's got the relay to Earth, it's got the other antennae, and it's got the altimetry sensor because we've got that contract to do a low resolution altimetry scan. Where is that? Um, yeah, low resolution altimetry scan of Mars, so this will be handling that. Uh, it's going to capture in orbit around Mars using this heat shield, so we're going to do an aerial capture, but it also has 2,286 internal ISP, and that is delivered using these advanced Gemini lander engines, and this is the tank for those. So, yeah, and I'll control with a Delta avionics package, and we recently unlocked larger solar panels, so we have these solar panel arrays, which should provide all the power we need. So that's the idea. Then we have a single Centaur, and it's only burning for six minutes. 
so it doesn't overburden the rest of the rocket. Uh, it's probable that the advanced Gemini lander engines will complete orbit for us. So yeah, also this is a little bit unbalanced because this altimetry sensor is a bit heavier than the dish and this um, RPWS antenna, radio plasma wave antenna. So yeah, I, I don't know how that's going to work out. But fortunately, it only has to pass through the atmosphere once and it'll have the RCS thrusters to help. Also, it's relatively heavy compared to those instruments. Okay, and here we have the Thor Delta Avionics Unit, which is better than the normal Thor Avionics Unit because it can handle 130 tons and weighs the same anyway. Here we have an NK-43, a single one and two NK-33s at the bottom, which you should have been able to guess by the numbering of the Nikos. So, no NK-31 on this one. So, most of the work to get to orbit is handled by the NK-43, but we get a little boost from these two NK-33s, plus boosters for the first time using solid rocket motors, not because they're a good idea at all, because they're actually quite expensive each. Uh, taking a look at the price for the Caster 1s, we see that um, they're 360 each, which is reasonably expensive. I thought they were more expensive, honestly. But, yeah, these Caster 1s are 360 each. And considering that the NK-33s themselves are 770, that means each two boosters is about the same as one NK-33, while the NK-33s are provide basically double thrust of two of these. So that's that's the unbalanced thing for you. We are not recovering anything, so it's all expendable. Uh, these are empty. These are just uh, to smooth out the lines because the NK-33s are a little bit wider than this body would normally be able to handle. Okay, so that's the idea. We haven't tried this rocket before. The whole launch costs uh, uh, 27000 The The launcher bit of this is about 11000 Actually, the first two stages only cost 8000 so the Centaur is 3000 all on its own. It's not... Is it really, really a Centaur? It's like a short Centaur. It's just the same diameter, but different length. Okay, so we'll pack it up, and this will be headed over to Mars. Hopefully. Our next mission is the Mars Jello on a Nico 1344. And I decided to make this pink. Basically, this entire tank is food, water, and oxygen. And it's about 10 tons worth of that. The orbiter is actually the small part this time. Instead of it being the large part, it's just this little guy here. And then that's the parachute. This is the Thor avionics unit, and then we have got lander engines and a heat shield, and this whole thing is supposed to land on the surface, hopefully close to the bopper. We want to test how well we can land things close together. It does have some science on it, just in case it lands in a different biome, but just the temperature barometer, you know, the small ones. And then it'll communicate back with the orbiter, and it's got its own solar panels here. And uh, this is just uh, go-around engines just to help uh, aim it properly into the atmosphere before being discarded. It's just an asterisk 2 with very little thrust. And it will probably also finish off our transfer. We'll have to see how that works out. This is a not Centaur stage. This is a 5RL10 stage. Don't know what to call it, but there you are. It's a 5RL10 stage and it has five meters of diameter. The next stage, well, the Nico 1344 is fairly easy to understand. There's still the nine engine core, but uh, four single engine boosters, all NK-33s and then four NK-43s and then four NK-31s. So that's the idea. Intended capacity to orbit, probably more than 65 tons. I'm hoping that we can relight the NK-31s to start us off on our road to Mars. We'll have to see about that, though. 
Okay, so that is that rocket. And of course, once we have the food, water, and oxygen on Mars, we would like to land Kerbals close to it, because 10 tons of food, water, and oxygen is a lot. I think it's close to two years worth, which would be a good amount for, and that's for three Kerbals, two years for three Kerbals, or something like that, between one and two years. So, very helpful, if, if they can access it, which is a big if. Our final mission, and the most expensive one, is the Mars quote-unquote tug on the Nico 2544. This is a rework of the failed Mars fuel depot, which had no electric charge, you remember, and so couldn't be controlled. This time, we've added uh, electric charge to this module here, so we have 74,000, which should be enough. So, yep, there we are. And also, I decided that we'd go with aero capture here, too. And so we've got the heat shield on top, and I moved the Apollo docking system off to the side. So we've got two propellant only and two Apollo docking systems on this. Not the best location for them, but uh, still accessible. And it's got the newly reworked solar panels, though those will have to be retracted if something docks into the propellant only docking ports. And it's got five Astros 2 engines and plenty of Delta V. The fuel up here is locked because that's the fuel we are delivering. It's got 13 tons of it. And it might be able to deliver some of this fuel here too because we're using the heat shield to capture. I don't know if we really need the Delta V, the 2164 Delta V that's in here, but it might be helpful if we need to make fine adjustments to our orbit and stuff like that. Okay, so that is the plan there. I, uh, I don't know what the safe altitude to bring these in at is, so we'll have to experiment with that separately. I mean, I've already, I've already done experiments uh, on live streams and stuff like that, but I really need to fine-tune my knowledge of the Martian atmosphere on transfers like this. And of course, the speed that you're going in at has a major effect on what altitude you should use to capture. Also, the mass and heat shield size has an effect on what altitude you should use to capture, so it's different for every mission really. Okay, uh, so this looks alright, and so we'll build that. And let's see what the Kerbal Construction Time queue looks like. Well, it sure looks like we'll have plenty of time. Uh, taking a look, it estimates uh, 63 days for the Mars tug, though with the Mars Jello thing uh, taking 70 days. I think the tug will take longer. Not sure. Bopper's only taking 33 days. But assuming that they're right about all that, you sum it all together, we're talking about less than 170 days when we have 229. So we could probably build some extra boppers. Maybe, maybe even uh, extra Jello. So we will find out. Of course, the Jello is in the second build slot, so that's why it's taking longer. Though it's surprising, the Nico uh, 2010, you would think, that would take a lot less longer than the Nico 1344. It's only got three main engines and then a single Centaur engine. The 1344 has, what, uh, 17, 21? 21, 21 uh, main stage engines, you know, the main rocket, three stages. And then it's got the Centaur stage with five. So... Uh, quite surprising how this stuff works out in Kerbal Construction time. Uh, we also should build one more thing, which is the next module for our station. We already have crew transfer vehicles here, the Kelly 4 on Nico 606, and also on the Nico 404, which is a little bit more dangerous. Um, so maybe we'll queue that up as well. But first I want to turn to the tech tree and see what we can do with our 367 science. Okay, so here, got actuators, uh, people want to see mature Hydrolox engines, though M1, KVD, not really the most enticing. We've, uh, here we've got closed cycle Hydrolox, which finally gets us the RS-25, but that unlock cost is 114000 and the cost of the engine itself is 5700 um, compare that with the NK33, which has a cost per engine of 800. So, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, remember, the 
in uh, the Nico uh, 2010, the entire first and second stages cost 9,000, right? Three engines and then all the boosters, right? Six boosters. Uh, that's uh, 9,000. A single RS-25 costs 5,700. Not to say I won't ever use it, but we better be able to reuse it, right? Um, nuclear propulsion uh, is expensive. So if you're worried that I'm going to jump on these things, this advanced stuff, keep in mind that the Nerva costs 25,000 in here. So we're talking about a space tug. We're not talking about even an upper stage. And look at the 60 ignitions. We have to keep that in mind. Uh, so it has limited usability. 25,000 cost is very expensive for us. And by the time we get out here, even though we can't see it right now, warp drives and that sort of thing, fusion rockets and antimatter stuff, we're talking about millions of funds or billions in the case of the warp drive billions of funds to actually build it I've built some in interstellar overhaul and the craft cost two billion funds I don't even know if we can have two billion funds if there are contracts that would give us that kind of money so yeah don't worry too much about the whole KSB interstellar thing I think I'm unlocking refined rocketry already because this Aerospike is one of the things I actually want. I think our science will be best spent on crew modules of some kind. Kerbal safety bubble. Jumbo Kerbal can. These are expensive, but, you know, these are the sorts of things that make for good missions. Heavy command modules and specialized command modules. I wonder what mods would put stuff in there, right? We, we know... KSB Interstellar puts stuff up there, but I don't know what puts stuff here. Integrated avionics, early space stations. Habitation modules, the mobile processing lab. We're already unlocking this. Let's go with early space stations. Oh, it's already being researched. Okay, good, because it ought to have been. Well, it looks like I'll uh, unlock mature Hydrolox engines after all. Let's just make sure I'm doing, yeah, I'm already doing that. And I'm already doing nuclear propulsion. Fine, mature Hydrolox it is. There you go. Okay, since I'm going to queue it up, I might as well introduce Spaceport 2 Module 2. And I haven't come up with any fancy names for these modules. Also on the Nico 707, we found out the Nico 707 could handle a heavier module so I made it heavier it's 30 tons and we've got food water and oxygen up here as normal it'll connect to the other module on this side so that uh, well we'll have the living quarters the food water and oxygen and then the tunnel and then more food water and oxygen and more living quarters and the downside is that the docking ports the lateral docking ports if you will uh, will be relatively close together. There'll be some here and some here. So that's not the best arrangement, but we'll go with it for now. It's got the solar panels on this side, just that, but these are the advanced solar panels, so better solar panelry, and hopefully that'll help the overall power situation. Um, I'm a little bit worried that the solar panels are going to bump into the much larger RCS ports. So I'm going to actually take the opportunity right now to shift those up a bit. I am looking to make sure that we have power. Yes, we do. We have 24,000 in each of these crew cabins. So I think everything is good. All right, let's pack it up and add it to the queue. Lots of things to build. Okay, here we are again with the Astra space plane. And, well... It says the right area and so what we're going to do is we're going to have this pinned up here and we're going to have this one pinned let's move this down a bit up here and then we'll see what the relative thrust is to gauge whether that's still a problem okay looks like we're ready to go a shame it's not daylight but hey this will work too ignition Uh, okay. 
It sure looks like they're the same, folks. Yeah, 9.9, 9.8. Alright, well, let's do a symmetry check. Let, let's put brakes on and then do a symmetry check. No? Okay, it was symmetrical in the VAB and the SBH, I swear. I had it uh, all nice and symmetrical, but now this is clipping into this. And I guess uh, somebody mentioned tweak scale as being a culprit. But, I mean, the reason why I thought it wouldn't be a problem is because they're attached by these tanks. They're not attached by the air intakes. So why resizing the air intakes would cause a problem? Well, we did resize the tanks, but that's a procedural parts thing. This is very annoying. Well, we'll bring it back in and we'll fix the symmetry again and try again later. Well, of course, the good thing about planes is if you recover them, it doesn't take much time or funds to fix them up. Well, let's see how this goes again. It looks like symmetry is okay. There you go. So that's verified. Ignition. I'm not controlling it at all. Okay, well, I'm gonna put some rudder in. You can see right now when it's frozen that the thrust is the same. And I'm gonna add brakes. See if anything's changed with the placement of the engines. Everything seems to be in order. I guess it's the landing gear, but boy, does the landing gear seem straight to me. You wouldn't think... Let's let's try uh, having it go again. Whatever, whatever direction this is. I'm not gonna go full throttle here. I mean, it doesn't look like it's the... Okay, so somebody mentioned maybe it's some sort of steering issue. Steering is enabled, gear blocked, no. And then on the other side, steering enabled, gear blocked, no. Wheel stress, zero. Okay, let's uh, apply brakes. Gear blocked, no, steering enabled. Um, I can set friction control to just one. I don't know whether that's going to help. That's normal. Normal. Nothing's inverted. We'll, we'll just try going like this. Well, obviously it's um, doing the same thing. Okay. It does pause quite a lot. Hmm. Okay. Um, well, let's say uh, just disable steering, disable steering, and just have the front wheel do the steering. How about that? Okay. Nope, it's still going. Now I'm going to try and, you can see I've got full right yaw, and it's not enough to control whatever's spinning this thing. And the rudder is in the correct position, what you would expect for full right yaw, as you can see. Okay, let's turn off steering on the front gear. So now there's no steering at all, except for the rudder. And uh, let's reset the rudder. Okay. And it automatically deviates to one side. Let's disable the rudder, how about that? Because, you know, what else? Now we're pointed south. Okay, reset the rudder. And I'm actually going to... Uh, mm, 
go to zero go to zero this one should just have yaw on as well okay I'm, I'm gonna have a lot of windows up because eventually if this actually goes somewhere I will want the rudder control to be active so I'll click on that when necessary okay uh, here we go again indeed it's just uh, rolling around there is no way to control yaw for it okay well let's unlock those it's got a huge vertical stabilizer so it's not like it's lacking in yaw control in theory and let's close those uh, let's check the thrust one more time and I'll go full power with it and I'm gonna keep the brakes on let's see what it maxes out at you can see that the well, okay The thrust is the same in both jets. And so there's no intake issue. Currently we're tilted a bit. I assume that's because of the land. It doesn't show that on the horizon though. I mean, the steering completely disabled makes no difference as to our ability to control this. Hmm. Well, doesn't cost that much. Uh, we've got all the things. Let, let me just try and yank it up into the air and see what happens. It has a lot of lag. I mean, can we get enough horizontal velocity to yank it up into the air? I don't know. It might just keep doing circles. Let me take SAS off. It's still doing circles even with SAS off if you were interested in seeing whether SAS was the cause of the problem. There's a lot of lag. Maybe because I've got too many craft in this save. I'm using full yaw to try and stop this. That's just me. Gotta add RCS. Not that that's particularly useful at this altitude. I don't see it firing, but I can see the fuel being used. Well, I think it's pretty conclusive that there's something really, really weird. And uh, maybe it's tweak scale with FAR. I mean, the only thing I can think of is, well, FAR thinks it's nominal. That uh, the fact that I've used a tweak scale intake is causing FAR some sort of issue. Those are the only tweak scaled parts, by the way. Now I know that tweak scale and far don't get along, so maybe that's that's the only thing I can think of at this point. I think we've ruled out everything else. So let's recover. Well, given all that disappointment, I think I'm going to reduce the priority of effective space planes in our technological development. Should be alright.
Okay, the next thing we need to take care of is our Jupiter Orbiter Maneuver Node, which is in 11 days. So, let's take a look at that. Uh, guys, something has happened. Uh, it says Ranger Block 3 Core exploded due to overheating. Just as I, I started recording. I don't think I got the... So, um, it looks like we have an overheating issue. Random overheating. This is not because of Jupiter. We saw the overheating issue with our previous Jupiter probe, right? And I'm going to delete that alarm. Hold on, let me close this. It completely disintegrated the probe. I'm trying to see where we were at. I mean... If you take a look at where it was, 723,000, well, 723 million kilometers from, from Jupiter, or was that, no, it was interplanetary space, 723 million kilometers from the sun. We weren't in Jupiter space yet. We're, we're out here somewhere, and Jupiter was supposed to catch up to us. I think it was, uh... A maneuver to correct I think I don't know well things exploded is all I know so yeah I don't know what to do about that this is uh, very disturbing hmm I actually don't remember which mission it was we've got another orbiter coming in in a bit, I think this was the one that was already in orbit around Jupiter and we wanted to make an adjustment to it to hit a uh, moon or something like that. I don't know. All I know is it exploded. So, well, what can we do? We'll hope that it was an isolated sort of incident with this particular probe and it's not going to duplicate with another probe. Otherwise, I'm going to have to troubleshoot something. Okay, well, on to the Mars missions, I suppose. Well, we're getting close to finishing our Mars missions, but we still have some time left before uh, Mars transfer window opens up, 126 days, but the tug, which was the last one, oh no, the second to last one, second to last one to complete, will be done in a minute. But uh, I just noticed that we have some new contracts that we could potentially fulfill. Uh, first is another Science Day from Space Around Mars, but much more interesting. Science Day from Space Around Phobos. Oh, it's still very sticky. I might want to restart before launching anything, given the sudden explosion of our Jupiter probe. Okay, um, Science Day from Space Around Phobos which also combine, combines with uh, from the surface of Phobos and also uncrewed Phobos landing to make an interesting combination of missions. So we should probably just launch the same probe that we launched to Deimos, perhaps with a more advanced rocket. Well, I mean, it's to be the Nico 621 LBD or maybe uh, because we're going to upgrade the engines, but that shouldn't take too long to build. I was thinking of making a Jupiter mission to replace that probe that we lost, but our contract, well, we have uh, two contracts here. We've got a Saturn flyby and stationary orbit of Jupiter. I think it would be much more important to focus on being able to do that Saturn contract and launching something new at Jupiter. Okay, anyway, so let me get that Phobos mission cooking. Alright, so I've decided that we would launch the Mars quote-unquote tug first because it takes the longest to roll out to the launch pad and it has the most spare fuel just in case launching it three days early leads to a lot of inaccuracy and of course it has the most spare fuel because it is basically a fuel tank. So let's line up with the moon just for simplicity's sake and hope that the launch pad doesn't explode while I'm time warping, that's important. Okay, throttle up, SAS on, and we don't need surface info. Here we go, ignition.
much. Those are some pretty impressive gravity losses we have there. I can't help but feel that that's not entirely accurate. Yep, something went horribly wrong there. Also have no idea how we got 1.5 meters per second in steering losses before we even started. I'm curious about these numbers, that's all. Okay, getting ready for booster set, booster set. And off they go. One more minute on the core. Well, no problems with the NK-33s, set. And ignition. Now for the NK-43s. Where did that fairing go? There's that fairing. It's time to drop the fairing. So, off it goes. Ooh. Oh no! Uh oh. Yeah, okay. That wasn't very good. So, even if we put tug in quotes, it doesn't seem like it works. Yeah, putting tug in quotes definitely does not is not sufficient. Um, hold on. Okay, so this is this is the powerful part of all this. We I don't know how much control we actually have. We do have communication. That's nice. But that might be lost once we lose the stage. Yep, we can't fool the game. Uh, it knows a fuel depot when it sees one. Yeah, it's quite possible that after we separate the stage we will have no communication with it, so... That's not all that great. After all, we the thing that blew up was the Saturn Instrumentation Unit, which provides control. Let's separate and ignite at the same time. That'll give us the best chance. Okay, here we go. Yeah, we have no connection as expected. But the stage is lit. And hopefully it'll get us to orbit. It might be a very elongated and weird orbit but it will still potentially be orbit. It's not spin stabilized though, so it could go awry. It's already tilting up higher. And I have no way of controlling that. I guess the payload does have a heat shield, but it doesn't have parachutes, so we can't recover it. I can't shut it down either. And their thrust exceeds whatever the five Astros engines can provide. Obviously right now we're not in the best situation. Uh, well, let's see what kind of catastrophe we can wreak like this. Oh right, I can't provide the signal. Okay, let's see what kind of catastrophe we can wreak like this. <laughs> Alright, here we go. Okay, can we knock ourselves to one side? Come on. We def I, I don't think we can steer it. Maybe we can steer it, I don't know. Time to wap waps, this is not going very well for us. Going all over the place. 
Okay, we are free. Let's um, maneuver. And we gotta get knocked by. Oh. Well, that was bound to happen, I suppose. Okay, well, this has been an episode of Many Explosions, the Jupiter Probe, and now this. I think I should end here, and we'll launch the rest of the Mars missions next time. This was the most expensive one, so that's a bit of a downer. But it wasn't one that was fulfilling a particular contract, so that's a plus side. So the ones that are trying to fulfill contracts are still to come. So yeah, let's let's uh, try and reset and do those in the next episode. So on that note, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did enjoy this episode, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.